if you have debilitating pain, exhaustion, like body aches and burnout, maybe your whole life, or like our special guest, since she was five years old, diagnosed with fibromyalgia, and you think all hope is gone. And you know, when you get that diagnosis, you get a, like a mystery grab bag of a whole bunch of other labels that are thrown at you. And we are going to dive into it today because our guest, Reba, Reba Shapiro, welcome. Hi. Hello. So happy to be here. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. I know the transformative story that you have, uh, and I know you have a ton of great tips and advice to share with people, um, both because of what you've gone through personally and professionally. And so I am so excited. Uh, if you're listening to this, grab a pen, grab it. You're going to want it to take some notes here because she's got some good stuff and, uh, and definitely share this with somebody who might be suffering with pain, fibromyalgia, CRPS. We're going to talk about what is that? Um, autoimmune conditions. You're in the right place. We gotcha. So Reba, just, uh, I know you're coming to to us uh, live here from New Jersey. Uh, you also love and have spent a lot of time in the beautiful state of Maine. Uh, you have a ton of credentials behind your name. Your, your youthful looks defy the academic accolades that we could throw at you here. Uh, we'll get into that as a little bit in your story. I'll let you share it. But tell us, what is it that you do and, and how did you go from that academic background and trajectory to the work that you're doing now? Yeah, yeah. So I'm so excited to dive into this. I am a holistic health coach. And I typically work with those who are living with fibromyalgia, complex regional pain syndrome, also known as CRPS, autoimmunity and burnout to increase the peace and balance that they feel in their bodies, their lives and their homes so that they can get back to feeling their best and doing all the things that they want to be doing with confidence and just excitement for life again. So yeah, I, I love what I do. Um, I'll be honest, I did not originally set out to be a health coach. Originally, my background mm -hmm. is in child development and family systems. And I really enjoyed that work. I mean, I worked in a preschool. I helped to bring supports to early educators in Maine that, um, you know, just help them take care of themselves better so that they could be in a better place to take care of their students. I ran a mentoring program um, for seven of the local public towns, the public schools and towns. And um, honestly, I loved the work that I was doing. I loved the topics that I was studying and, and just everything that I got to be doing. And professionally, everything seemed to be going really well, mm -hmm. but my personal life was a little bit more bumpy. So as you shared before, I have been living with fibromyalgia and CRPS mm -hmm. autoimmunity symptoms since before I was five years old. Mm -hmm. So it really, um, has, you know, shifted the trajectory trajectory of my life and the, um, the choices that I've made and the path that I've been on. And so that is really where all of this has come together. And I'm so excited and so blessed to be able to do this work that brings it all together. So, yeah. so, so incredible. And, and being diagnosed at the age of five, I think that's the youngest I've personally ever heard of. Like, it's not usually that young that someone is diagnosed. And I can't imagine, you know, as a child, you look up to your parents, your teachers, you know, what to do. And, and it must be very frightening. Um, tell us, and, and you had, you lived with this for years. So tell us a little bit about what was it like to be like a five-year-old, a child with this pain, or tell us a little bit about the symptoms. What, how did that look for you? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, honestly, I felt really different from other kids my age. Um, I was dealing with weird pains that didn't have a cause that we could point it to. Mm -hmm. I was so sensitive to touch that I couldn't be hugged by my family. I couldn't like do normal things with my friends. And um, I put on a lot of weight that just didn't really make sense as to where it was coming from. It was really... Um, 
widespread. I mean, I was sleeping every single chance that I got. I had to stop dancing. I was told to stop dancing. Mm -hmm. I was pulled out of gym class to try to, you know, mitigate any potential that I could hurt myself any further. But for the most part, I just, I felt so different from everyone else. And there was nothing that I wanted more than to just be a normal kid living a normal life. And um, so, yeah, I, I definitely looked to my parents. I looked to teachers and doctors and, and all of these people that I thought could guide me and help me and point me in the right direction. And um, honestly, it, it was a long time before we, we really found anything that worked. By the time I was 12, I was visiting lots of different specialists at different research hospitals. My parents were so supportive, taking me wherever we were recommended to go and doing the tests and all of the different things that, that were suggested. Um, but so often those appointments would come back and we would just be told, you know, your labs are normal. We just really don't know what's going on. Maybe it is psychosomatic. Maybe there's something else going on here, but it's not our specialty. So we'll point you to somebody else. And so there was really a lot of bouncing around or um, suggestions that were kind of, you know, like we could offer this for the time being and, and you might have to be on it lifelong. And that included medications and different therapies. And at one point I was um, recommended to take literal months off of school. And, and it mm -hmm. wasn't a predetermined amount of time. It was just however long it could possibly take to go into like an inpatient, basically like pain reset boot camp. Um, and that being the student that I am and loving learning yes. the way that I do that, that did not sit well with me. So I was not on board with it. And I didn't do it. I took some of what they recommended that was going to be a part of the program and some of the other suggestions that were made, like going to physical therapy, seeing a chiropractor, seeing yeah. a psychologist, seeing, um, you know, all of these alternative medicines and, and other types of ways to manage what I was dealing with. Um, that did end up helping for the most part. I was able to really get back into like a little bit of normalcy as high school mm -hmm. and college progressed. But for the most part, it's, it was a lot of, you know, just bouncing around and a lot of, we don't know. So this is our best guess. And this is the best that we have to offer right now. And so other than a little bit of a break there, for the most part, it was, it was really just a continual cycle from the time I was five years old. So yeah. Wow. I can't imagine, you know, as a kid, uh, it, it hurting to be touched. I mean, it's one of the things with fibromyalgia, like hugging, they're not huggers as a rule. I mean, and it hurts. But for a, a five-year-old, all the family, everybody feels like they get to hug you and they want to hug you. And then you might not have the language to say, you know, no, <laughs> and, you know, not hurt people's feelings. And then they're like, you know, I can imagine and and not being able to do dance and not being able to like, do gym and participate and do things with your friends. Um, it's, it's kind it is one thing as an adult, which it also is very isolating, but as a kid, um, you know, to just want more than anything, you know, just to live a normal life. It's, is it too much to ask? And, uh, so I can't imagine all of that, that what you went to, although now kind of looking back, I think you appreciate like why you went through that because it has allowed you to become the expert in this field that you now are, and you can now give back because you, you went through it the hard way <laughs> and that you're, you know, relatively young years, you're not 80, uh, you've got decades of experience uh, behind you in this. So um, yeah, it's just really a unique combination. So I guess a couple of things. Let's start with, um, uh, well, let's go back to, you know, um, you mentioned CRPS bef before. So first we have a wide variety of uh, audience. Uh, I always liked, and you did, you, you did spell it out. Tell us a little bit about to people, what is CRPS? Um, and maybe, yeah, well, let's start there and then we'll look at like, well, how, how exactly did you get on the other side of it? Tell us a little bit more about that journey. So it was really bad. It was really awful. Uh, I got a little reprieve in high school. Um, I think after you graduated college though, like it really like ramped up again. We'll talk a little bit about that. And I really want to circle back around there. Like, okay, these people who are watching, they want to know, okay, how did you get on the other side? But first, let's just make some definitions. What CRPS, you know, tell us a little bit about what, what more, whatever you want to share with that regard. 
Yeah. So CRPS stands for complex regional pain syndrome. It is um, characterized by pain in one specific region of the body, typically following an injury or a surgery or trauma of some kind to that specific part of the body. It is um, often accompanied by swelling, burning, and aching sensations. Um, it's really thought to involve inflammation as well as the nervous system and an interplay between them and how the body is um, heightened to these pain sensations. And they could be triggered by pressure. They could be triggered by um, temperature changes. But ultimately, it is a really intense sensation of pain in one specific region of the body. So that is um, really a big part of my journey and where that came from. And, and I didn't have anything necessarily that they could point to as the specific trauma. Of course, I had had injuries and things like that. I was a kid doing kid things before yeah. things happen. And I was doing cartwheels in the yard and I was roughhousing with my brothers and doing all these things. So it's, it's not that there weren't injuries or things, but it really was um, kind of a surprise to be given that diagnosis at first. And it, it definitely made sense with the symptoms that I was having and, and where things were progressing and how things were showing up. So, and I, yeah. I think so many people uh, in that scenario with fibromyalgia, it, they get, they don't get one diagnosis. They get it like a grab bag. It's, it's something around like this. <laughs> it's yeah. something here. Maybe it's chronic fatigue. Maybe it's fibromyalgia. Maybe it's, maybe it's this, maybe it's autoimmune this. And, and you had that experience too. Tell us a little bit about that. So tell us a little bit about when it ramped up um, after graduation with some of the things, you know, I know that they did a bunch of tests and there was even some genetic conditions in that. And, and just kind of like, what did it feel like going through that journey of like trying to find an answer? And then how the heck did you turn that ship around? How did you get to where you are now? Yeah. So after college, after having approximately six to eight years of, of some relatively normal years in my life. Mm -hmm. I graduated. I was looking forward to the future. I was um, receiving awards from the mayor in the town for the work that I was doing as part of the mentoring program. I was um, accomplishing really great things in my master's program. I did end up graduating with a 4.0. So all things were looking good. But at the same time, my body was just taken a turn for the worst and nothing was working anymore. None of the coping strategies, none of the, nothing was helping. So back we went to lots of specialists and lots of testing. And at this point, being a little bit older, there were more options to explore. There, when I was a kid, there was a lot of um, you know, hesitation to officially label anything or to do certain tests just because of my age. So the fact that I was older, I was in my early twenties, of course, when I graduated college, there was a little bit more, um, awareness that we could do a little bit more technology and medicine had advanced a little bit. And so we were able to take advantage of that. But as we were having conversations about, my symptoms and about what was coming up and what was happening. I blew up again. I had lost a lot of weight as I went through school, you know, lost the butt, the baby fat, but also the weight that came along with my symptoms when I was younger and I was at a comfortable weight. And then all of a sudden after college, it, I blew up again and I put on almost 40, 50 pounds. Wow. Um, and I'm a, I'm a very little person. I'm only about yeah. five feet. So that's pretty significant. Yeah. Um, I was experiencing rashes all over my body. I was sleeping again all the time, sometimes 16 to 18 hours a day. I was having trouble working. I was having trouble just doing any of the normal daily activities to go grocery shopping and come home and put them away was more than I could handle sometimes. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the testing, a lot of the doctor's appointments were really to determine, is it a correct diagnosis? Is there more than one diagnosis happening? Is there just something else that we haven't found yet? And so ultimately we kind of came to the conclusion that CRPS is a part of it, but also fibromyalgia, which has a lot of similarities to CRPS. It is also characterized by pain, um, more musculoskeletal pain, but also um, 
a little bit of the nervous system and a, di a dysfunction of the nervous system, it does come along with forgetfulness and brain fog and anxiety and sleeplessness and the exhaustion that comes with sleeplessness yeah. and all of these other pieces. So we kind of knew, all right, so CRPS, fibromyalgia. And then uh, some of my testing showed that there was the progression of an autoimmune condition. And so what did that look like and how is that interacting things with things? So some of my um, testing showed um, the way that my body processes inflammation is a little bit slower, a little less um, adept at dealing with the inflammation. And so we really were able to narrow down inflammation is a big part of this where it's coming from. We're not exactly sure, but there is something underlying this that is triggering inflammation that is triggering this high heightened amount of pain and exhaustion and all of these other symptoms. But as we were going through this, I was trying my hardest to live a normal life. I mean, I had just graduated college. I was trying to start my career. I was trying to make plans and continue the trajectory that I had been on. And I was pushing past the physical limits that my body would let me do. I mean, my, I used to say my mind and my body are in two different places right now. My mind yeah. is like, let's do this. We are yeah. ambitious. We're getting this stuff done. And my body was like, hold up. We need to slow down. I need you to take care of me. I need you to start paying attention to these signals that I'm trying to send you to tell you what it is that I need. And so that was really where I think the biggest switch was, was I had to pause. I had to slow down and start to accept that my body was trying to tell me something. And instead of pushing it away and looking externally for the doctor or the test or whatever miracle pill or cure to come along, I really had to make the decision to take an active role in my health and be someone who did listen and learn to interpret the signs that my body was telling me and basically learn what my body's language was so that I would be able to make choices and make decisions and create habits that nourished my body instead of pushing my body past what it felt like it was able to do. And so that I think was, was the biggest shift that I had to make was, was just making that decision for myself there. Yeah, your story is just so powerful. I think a lot of people are resonating. They they know how like just traumatic and debilitating that is to go through something. Now, the good news is you got on the other side of it and you weren't really looking in you know, the, the external miracle pill for the solution uh, to do, you weren't waiting on that. You took matters into your own hands. How did it feel? Tell us what it feels like to be on the other side of that. Like, tell us a little bit about that to go from, you know, don't do gym, don't do dancing, don't do this. You can't hug anybody. You can't go outside. You can't, you, you know, you can't even put the groceries away to go from that to the life you live now. Just give people a little bit of hope of what's, what's possible. Let's start there. And what did that feel like? Yeah, it's funny. I have two images that come to mind. So I'll paint those pictures for you of, um, I look back on those years now of being completely bedridden, not able to work, not able to do any of the things that I wanted to do, not even, even being able to see my friends or family or anything like that. And just living with that constant debilitating pain and exhaustion, I see that almost like a redacted line now in the timeline of my life, just this thick black redacted line. And I say that in, in looking at like the, the things that I was able to do, but I do see that time also as that time that I needed to go inward. Mm -hmm. And so I went hiking a couple of years ago now in, um, Washington state. And it, it was a pretty strenuous hike. It, I had done a hike like that similar a number of years ago when I was traveling. And I honestly never thought when I was laying in bed that I would ever be able to do something like that again. Mm -hmm. It was intense. It was a little like knees to chest the whole way, especially for someone as little as I am. And it really was difficult. But when I got to that Vista, when I got to the top and I saw those views and I I honestly just cried like tears of joy and hope and just happiness and this relief that I was able to do this, even though I thought I would never be able to see views like that again for myself or to be able to do hikes like that again at any point in my life. So I really 
I take, I cherish that moment. I think back to that moment. I feel back into that moment so much of just that. This is why I never gave up hope. This view, this experience being in this place, this is why I did all the things that I did. And so in order to get there, it was a journey. I mean, it was, it was a climb in itself to get to be able to do that climb on that mountain. But the first thing I had to do was look at what was I doing in my daily life? And was I taking the time and putting the intention and the dedication into the choices and the habits that I was living every single day? And I realized that I wasn't doing a whole lot in my day-to-day life to nourish my body, to take care of my body. I had kind of come to this place of complacency and just looking again, external for that doctor or that miracle pill or whatever it was. And I kind of just found myself sitting in this period of waiting. And I, I had to decide I'm not going to just wait anymore. I, I was so young. I mean, I was five years old when all of this started, but at this point I was in my early twenties and I just I could not imagine living the rest of my life with this same pattern and these same things coming up. So what did I do? What, where do I start? Where do I go from a period of, I just don't know. And I'm waiting for someone else to tell me I went back to basics and I went back to some of those seemingly simple kind of practices that felt insurmountable, just enormous. Like how, how do I regulate my sleep patterns? How do I find movement that feels good in my body when exercise hurts and I don't enjoy it? And how do I find food that makes me feel my best? And so I really, um, realized that I had some gaps and that was what originally brought me to explore the world of health coaching and enroll in the health coaching certificate program. I really did do that for myself and my own personal journey initially. And I had to pull from my background and my education and some of these things that I knew had helped me in the past. And some of those things that did help when I was able to find some relief in those earlier years. And so starting from that place of what worked before, what are some of these smaller practices that I can start implementing in my life? And how do I get back to basics and start interpreting those messages from my body there? So good. I can picture you on the top of that mountain and just what a, what a relief sort of at the top of the mountain, sort of figuratively and literally, uh, it's so profound and getting back to basics. The other thing I'm hearing from your story is that discernment. So through the journey, there's been lots of things that people have said, and then you kind of going inside and saying, okay, well, what, what foods work for me? What, what exercises work for me? These exercises that people are doing that sends the the pain like (laughs) off the charts. I can't do that, but what can I do? And it's very similar, exactly aligned with what I taught as when I was a health coach, but also now what I teach our health coaches. So I'm like, what can you do? What do you like? What do you know that positive focus and my little tagline be good for you and really determining what is that? What is good for you? What do you like? What foods are good? What movements are good? What sleep is good? Um, And and that applies to people's health coaching practices. And it also applies to uh, their their health and their, you know, their livelihood, their relationships, you know, be good for you. So I really love, um, you know, I'm I feel so sorry that you had to go through so much at such a young age, but look at how far you've come at also, you know you know, a young age and, and now what you can turn around and offer is just immense. And I think potentially part of your, part of your youth was in your favor, you know, like if, um, if you had been, I don't know, 60 or 70 or something, when you're diagnosed, you're like, oh, well, (laughs) okay. But you're like, I've got my whole life ahead of me. And you graduate college and you're like, here we go world. Nope, we're not. (laughs) It's like your body's like, you're like, yes, let's go 4.0. I'm off to, you know, change the world. And then your body's like, yeah, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. And so I think what you've come out on the other side has been so profound. I love that you became a health coach to heal yourself first, to help yourself first. And really it was about taking your own power back 
I hear that story over and over again. And uh, we always say as health coaches, your first client is you, <laughs> you know, you got to be good for you first. And so uh, is that all of this journey that you're at? So you became a health coach really to take your your matters into your own hands. But, you know, is that kind of tell us a little bit about that? Is that why you became a health coach and and anything else that you want to add about that? Yeah. Um, yes and no, <laughs> I guess is the best way to answer that. Um, I fully had every intention of going back into my work with child development and families and, and just continuing that path that I had been on before. But once I was introduced to health coaching, once I saw just how holistic, holistic wellness really is, the way that it looks at every area of a person's life, but also the interconnectedness of the systems that an ill person is actually a part of. Like when one person is ill, it doesn't only impact them, it impacts everyone else around them and every area of their life as well. And so I really started to see the way that this actually did support that original mission of helping to instill these foundations that really were going to be things that helped people create healthy, happy, successful, and fulfilling lives. And being able to do that from a place of health and of knowing how to take care of ourselves, even when we have the cards stacked against us, it feels like. I also noticed that, um, I almost fell into a number of gaps. I was almost swallowed by these where I didn't have anyone advocating or kind of supporting me along the way or saying, you know, let's look at this or let's look at that. If stress was mentioned, it was kind of like, well, you don't know, you just don't know how to deal with stress. Or if food was mentioned, it was more, you need to lose weight. And these things were more in isolation of each other, as opposed to being a big part of everything that was going on. And so I started to see as I was stepping into this health coaching world and seeing what that looks like and seeing the role that a health coach could play, that that is what a health coach can do is help prevent people from being swallowed by those gaps that I almost was, and instead kind of help them navigate and move through how is this connected to this and how is this connected to this and how can we maybe use that interconnectedness to support the elevation of all of these areas and the optimization of your life as a whole, because you are a whole person and these things are very much connected and to treat them as such that they're not doesn't really address the whole picture. So that was really where I think I started to see health coaching as this is a part of my mission. And this is a part of, of my life's goal and purpose and where I am seeing that enjoyment and that fulfillment that I look for, it gives me hope. And it it gives me a feeling of comfort to know that by doing this and helping someone take care of themselves, there is a ripple effect to every other area of their life and to every other person in their life as well. and, And helping them to navigate that and do the best for them as well as be a role model for others. I love what everything that you've said, and it's really about taking that, you know, holistic approach and really the missing link for you uh, in your journey to help yourself get your life back, get your health back is really not taking any one piece, nutrition or diet or stress or sleep or exercise in in isolation, but instead integrating it into the whole, uh, which is one of those things that, you know, when I went to IIN, it is one of the things that I learned, uh, you know, it's, it's the whole picture. And that resonated to the core of my being, you know, having been a medical doctor for 25 years, and then just going, man, if, if people could improve their lifestyle, we could have profound effects. And it's just like, flipping the switch. And it's those things that are easy to do, but then easy not to do. Like, like you were saying, getting back to basics and taking that. Um, where did you go to uh, school to become a uh, health coach, Reva? IIN also. I did their go. health coach training training program. I did their gut health coaching program, their hormone health coaching program. So I'm currently in their uh, board exam prep course as well. So IIN has been a part of my journey since the beginning of my health coaching times. I, I love it. I love IINers. I mean, that's, uh, I don't know where I'd be without IIN actually. Like I would 
I don't know if I'd actually physically be here, to be honest. I mean, I was a medical doctor, uh, just completely, you were talking about swallowed by your health and I was swallowed by the medical system as a, you know, tertiary subspecialty care medical doctor. And, um, and, but I knew there was a better way and I just didn't know how to piece it together, package it together. How could I help people? And that led me on this journey. And, and, you know, uh, I just love being able to do whatever I can to support health coaches because they've been through something and they know firsthand. And there's one thing to like Google it or look it up in a book or do eat something because somebody told you should eat it or not eat something. But when you look at the whole picture, look at the results for you, debilitating pain, excruciating, you know, exhaustion, not able to socialize, not have a life and to completely turn that around and then transform other people's lives. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the reach that you've had. Absolutely tremendous. Um, and so, yeah, so uh, I was just curious about that. So how do you work with your clients? So you, you've you now gotten on the other side of, of this um, and we're, it's always a journey, but you know, you're know you living a really great life. It's night and day compared to where you were. Um, how do you work with your clients? And, and tell us a little bit about who are they? How does that work? Yeah, so most of my clients are women, mothers, and high achievers who have diagnoses of fibromyalgia, complex regional pain syndrome, autoimmune conditions, um, and experiencing symptoms of burnout. And they really are coming to me with complaints of being overwhelmingly stressed out, exhausted, often pushing past their limits, feeling more than uncomfortable in their body, feeling like they've put weight on or they're swollen feeling like they really don't even remember a time before they had this stiffness, this tension, any of these other symptoms that, that they are coming to me saying like, I just, I don't know what to do about this. And so they really are looking for peace and balance in their body, but also their life, their home and, and all of everything that encompasses everything they're doing. So what I do is I walk them step-by-step step through a process of helping them to create these lifestyle shifts and habits that help them to move from these feelings of being constantly overwhelmed and stressed out, having that feeling of discomfort, debilitating pain in their body, even mistrusting their body for um, not, not believing that their body will support them in what it is that they want to do. And I bring them to this place of regaining a sense of confidence and comfort within their body so that they can improve their stress resilience. They can optimize their lifestyle. They can have that feeling of, I can do this. And I feel my best both inside and out. And I'm seeing that in every area. So I work with them really closely. I work with a lot of my clients virtually. So it's really easy to meet with anyone from anywhere, which I love. I love getting to hear from different people in different places. And I really do um, include a lot of loving accountability and support. I think when we're doing these things, it's important to have an air of gentleness and lovingness because this is hard. I mean, yeah. I, yeah. when I say that these are simple, basic things, that doesn't mean they're not hard and they're not yeah. difficult to implement. I mean, yeah. it's, it's one thing to say, you know, I need to prioritize my sleep. It's another thing to allow your body to sleep for 16 to 18 hours a day and, and yeah. work our way back from that. So I really try to bring that. I actually have a, a phrase that I, I've used for myself sort of as a mantra and I give to my um, clients now to use as an affirmation for themselves as well of for tomorrow with love. Everything that we're doing today, we are doing tomorrow and we are doing it with love because if we're doing it with love, it has a very different impact than if we're doing it begrudgingly and with resentment and with these other like because I have to feelings, but instead of looking at it as I am creating the life that I want to live and I am creating that life by being and taking care of the person that I want to be. And so I really try to walk through what it is for this person in their individual personalized plan so that they can get those sustainable results that will allow them to take it with them all throughout their life and doing all the things that they want to do. Oh, I love that. And for tomorrow with love is your Instagram handle, isn't it? It is. It yeah, is. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Perfect. And it's great that you just explained like, where does that come from? And that makes total sense. 
So Reba, what is the biggest myth when it comes to overcoming like just this overwhelming exhaustion and debilitating pain? I mean, you know, complex regional pain syndrome, fibromyalgia since you were five years old and to overcome that. Uh, what is the biggest myth that you see when it comes to overcoming these like insurmountable odds? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think the biggest myth is believing that we are helpless to the deterioration of our health and wellness once it begins, no matter what age that is, whether it's five, whether it's 25, whether it's 55 or 95, like believing that, that this deterioration is just it is what it is kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then expecting and waiting for, uh, again, that external source to deliver that miracle pill or cure or, or tell you exactly what it is that, that it needs to be kind of thing. And that we have no control over it ourselves. And that leaves people feeling helpless and hopeless and just, you know, like a victim. And I, I think that that is one of the most dangerous parts of this myth mm -hmm. um, because it really does disempower people. So I think that the moment I decided and the moment I've seen my clients decide to take that active role in their life and have that be a continual place of, I need to look at this and how can I improve this area, whether it's sleep, whether it's food, whether it's exercise, whether it's mindset, whatever it may be, the moment they decide to take an active look and continually do so is when they start to see things shift. And so I think um, really what it comes down to is understanding that the answer is not outside. It is not in some external source and that the body does know more about what it needs and is trying to communicate to you more about what it needs than most people realize. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so good. You know, I, I do a lot of these interviews with health coaches and most of them have overcome some really significant health challenges. Uh, like you, like me, I, I went, I was going to be a doctor and then and I ended up being a health coach. You were, you know, in child development and then here you are. And then it's our, you know, that personal journey. And the one thing that I hear, the theme I hear over and over and over again is that flipping of the switch from seeking externally for answers in a test, give me the label, give me the diagnosis, give me the supplement, give me the pill, give me the surgery, give me the thing, find me the miracle doctor, find me the miracle cure, rather than reaching out there for that. Once they flip that, and instead of looking out there and they look within and go, well, what can I do? And then really honing in on that relationship with the body and, and really seeing, okay, what makes, what makes this body sing? What makes it, you know, not feel good. And you talk a lot. In fact, you speak on um, something called the anti-inflammatory lifestyle. And so it's really all about that. It's kind of figuring out what are the things that are inflaming you uh, in all ways, not just nutrition. And what are the things that are soothing you and, and empowering and strengthening uh, you? So I love that. Why do you think it is so important for, for people to take ownership of their health to like, to really like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take, not that and obviously it's not their fault, but why do they have to kind of like take matters into their own hands and not just kind of wait? Well, I hope when's, when's my turn, when's my turn for the cure? Uh, why do you think that's so important? Yeah, I think it's really important for a couple of reasons, actually. So the first is that it gives back a sense of empowerment that chronic mm -hmm. illness patients tend to feel that they lose or that they have to give up as they're going through this journey. Um, and when we lose our sense of empowerment, it, we really do lose our willpower and our motivation to pursue whatever it is that is disempowering us. And then that disempowerment about our health is really when we start to see the impacts of deteriorating health, both direct, such as just spiraling and worsening of, of the symptoms that someone is experiencing, but also indirect with the development of depression and anxiety and other mental and spiritual health consequences mm -hmm. in that way. So it really becomes this tangled web of direct and indirect consequences. And it's a lot harder to untangle that web than it is to head it off. And right. ultimately, we all know where we are giving our all or where we are putting the majority of our intention and following through with that in our lives. We all get to choose 
are we moving our body? Are we sleeping the appropriate amount? Are we nourishing our body? And when we have that choice, when we take back a sense of that empowerment, we can start to sort of head off that tangled web that, that becomes this, this jumbled mess that is so hard to sort through and figure out where to begin. And the second um, reason I think it is so important is from my background in working with children and working with families, when adults and other figures, whether they are ill or not, model for the children in their lives and others in their lives in general, what it means to take care of themselves in a holistic manner, what it means Mm -hmm. to nourish our physical health and our mental health, what it means to take care of our home environment or cook or pursue our academic and career goals. All of these things are being modeled for the children that are around and the other people that are around. And so when we see these Um, you know, productive habits. And we see these habits that are nourishing to the life that someone wants to build. These children start to learn these as normal and they have a lot less to unlearn because they're forced to by something like chronic illness. So I think it's, it, it is so important because we can break these cycles and we can create really strong holistic foundations for the children of today and tomorrow so that they can start by looking at what feels normal and they really can take the key lessons from that without having all of these other things that they have to kind of sort through and dig through and what feels good and what they, it's normal to them. And so they can just take that key foundation into their successful, happy, healthy, fulfilling futures without having to undo it all the way that so many of us have had to. So, so important. You know, people do what you do, not what you say. The power of that modeling. I mean, it, it's how we learn as in, infants, you know, before we have language and and you see it. Even even I had two dogs at one point. The, 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 dog, the younger dog would follow what the older dog did. Like it just, it the older dog trained the younger one and, and people modeled that. And, and uh, I think we've seen that if anyone you know, well, if anyone's lived a life, they, they know if, if you've had someone younger than you or in your surroundings, uh, you know, children or, or friend, they will do, if you're a teacher, they will do what you do more so than that. And there's not anything that a parent wants than is, you know, to help set a positive role model. And I think sometimes people are like, well, kind of given up hope. I feel helpless. I have, I've been trying this for years and I haven't found relief. And I think you've just given them a reason, a why they should don't give up. A, you can get on the other side of it like you and B, uh, let's do this, as you say, for tomorrow, for tomorrow, wellness is your brand. Uh, You know, do that for your your children, for the future generations, be that inspiration for them, much like you are the inspiration for for your clients, they can be that inspiration for their family. And, and uh, so, so important. What are, so uh, viewers, <laughs> grab a pen, <laughs> grab some paper. Uh, this is all good. And this is profound. And it is at the basics that we're talking about. And it is important to take ownership and easier said than done. And you're going to do it with massive love. Somebody's sitting here and they're like, this is all really good, but I am in agony and I am exhausted. Help me, please. What can I do right now? What are some practical tips? What are some things that they can do to start pointing in that direction of relief? Yeah. Oh, I have a few for you. So I hope you have that pen and paper ready. So the first thing I would say is to never forget that you have the capability to to nurture and nourish yourself and that you can take an active role in your health and wellness. So often I see people who fell into that same trap that I did of just waiting for the next doctor, the next test, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But really the truth of it is we have every single day plenty of opportunities to make a choice that supports our well-being or doesn't. And so never forgetting that you can take that ability and do something with it and actually nurture and nourish yourself is, is the biggest thing I would say first. The second thing I would say is slow down, start where you are and don't overlook the simple things. So if you are noticing that your body is requiring more sleep, prioritize your sleep. 
make sure that you're staying hydrated. If you notice that certain types of exercise don't feel good in your body, find ways to move your body that you do enjoy. I know for myself, when I was first getting into that, I just started with walking and just dancing to some of my favorite songs in my bedroom, nothing intense, nothing choreographed, nothing like that, or just doing some gentle stretches, whatever it is that helps your body to feel good and that you enjoy start there. Start with eating some real whole food and figuring out what food makes your body feel best and what food makes your body feel worse. Don't forget about getting sunlight. Don't like do some of these things that you can do starting where you are, no matter where you are and work your way from there. Just don't forget to look at those simple things. The second thing, or the third thing, I guess I would say is to make things easier for yourself and surround yourself with the things that bring you comfort and joy. So, so often I see people who are working against their environment, who are working against people and places and systems that just don't support what it is that they and their body need in order to take care of themselves. So I always recommend to my clients, find a space where you can create your sanctuary, a place where you can retreat to, and then reemerge from feeling rejuvenated. And then surround yourself with loving, supportive people who feel like sunshine and who truly do want the best for you and will support you in achieving that and working towards that. And then the last thing I would say, um, and probably arguably one of the most important is to remember that health and wellness does not look the same for everyone. So I kind of alluded to that with start where you are, Mm -hmm. but it is true that health and wellness doesn't always look like going for a run for miles first thing in the morning. And it doesn't only look like eating and drinking green smoothies and doing all of the things that are, are, you know, like those, those quintessential, these are the health and wellness practices that you have to do. Mm -hmm. Everyone is different. Sometimes it really does look like finding and customizing a plan that works specifically for you and surrounding yourself with the things and the people that help you to feel your best. Love that, Reba. Thank you so much for that. And to our viewers, those are things that are doable. They they are doable. It might not be, as she said, they're they're like simple, basic things. They might not be, and both Reba and I get it. Like it's easy to do, easy not to do. Like it's, it's, they're simple things, but it's not that easy. You know, it's as far as that goes in practicality and we get it, but it's about, pointing yourself in the direction of your dreams of, of, of where your future self is, your, your tomorrow wellness and really focusing on it and feeling good in your body today. Like we're, we're big proponents of present moment, even though she talks about for tomorrow, but you might not even be able to imagine that relief right now. And we want you to like hook into a little hold of it, do it the best that you can today and, and take those building blocks, those little teeny tiny steps to get to that future where you do have that relief and you are living more of that, you know, joyful wellness life that, uh, that Reba gets to enjoy right now. Uh, so, uh, what are some, this is one of my favorite questions to ask. What are some of those spinoff benefits that you've seen when you work with your clients? Cause what I know is when we take this holistic approach, uh, it's not just the pain that gets better. There's a whole bunch of other bonus benefits that you get that you didn't even expect. It's just like, like wonderful things. Just once it gets on a roll, once things are going in the wrong direction, it goes that way. The momentum goes that way. But once you start taking these positive steps, implementing some of these things, it just gets better and better and better. And we can really get on a roll. So I love sharing some of these inspiring stories. Just share, you know, one or two clients maybe that you've worked with or stories that you have about, you know, what are some things that have that have happened that people might not even imagine that A, could happen or you know, it'll just kind of paint the picture of what that looks like. Yeah. I love this question. Also, I think the spinoff benefits are always such a surprise almost to the people who are experiencing them too. And it's so great to see that reflection and to hear that joy and excitement in their voice as they're talking about these um, wins that, that they get to enjoy now. So one of my clients has had some of the best examples, I think, of some of these spinoff benefits. Yes. 
early on in our time working together, only maybe two or three sessions in, she said to me that she was noticing a shift in herself and that she was starting to feel like she was able to communicate and she wasn't as stressed out all the time, which meant she wasn't as irritable all the time, which meant she was able to actually enjoy some of the interactions she was having with the people in her life. But one of the most amazing moments was when she said to me, and my husband sees it too. He said to me that I am so much calmer, that things just seem like they have really shifted. And the it's one thing to feel it in yourself. It's another thing to hear it from someone else who's saying that they recognize it within you. And so that was huge for her, but it was even better as time went on that she started noticing the same improvements in other relationships in her life, like at her job with her coworkers and and with friends and family outside of her marriage. So I think that is, is just such a great example, but then to top it off, as we continued working together, she began noticing that the debilitating symptoms that left her in bed for days in the weeks leading up to her period were starting to go away and that they had dramatically reduced up to the point we were having this conversation where she didn't even know she was getting her period. And so she was no longer bedridden by these symptoms and taking really high amounts of prescription medications to deal with the pain. Instead, she gets to feel good in her body all month long, which was something that that would have been so wonderful for her to experience, but was so difficult for her to envision in the beginning. So that was such a wonderful surprise spin-off benefit for her to see and for her to reflect on and how wonderful it is that she gets to do whatever she wants to do feeling yeah. good all month long now. Another woman that I worked with has shared some of her reflections and realizations in looking back on the things that she used to not be able to do that she can do now almost as if she doesn't even recognize them sometimes. Like they've, they've just become mm -hmm. part of this normal routine that she's almost forgotten she couldn't do them at one point. And so looking back on it, she was telling me that she used to spend just so much time recuperating from things. And now she gets to spend back-to-back -back days doing lots of energetic activities with the children and her family. Whereas before she would have had to have taken such long naps and such long breaks to get away from the overstimulation of those same activities that now she doesn't have to, she can be a fully present part of these interactions with these children. That means so much to her in her life. She's also mentioned to me that traveling has become such a pleasure at this point for her. In the past, she used to have to plan trips and vacations with needing almost re like recovery time on both ends, the preparation, right. but also the weeks. And, and yes, I say, I say weeks on purpose mm -hmm. of recovery period to get back into that normal life when she would come home from whatever the trip that vacation needed from that vacation, basically. Yeah. And she would have to take on a car ride, let alone if she was flying somewhere, four to five bags of just supportive instruments and different things that would help her if her symptoms were flaring up. She would have to take with her, you know, her own pillow, her own blankets, a hot pack, supplements, medications, pain relief lotion, braces, extra shoes, extra wow. clothes, just in case things were just not comfortable enough for her to get through her day. And now she gets to travel by herself, which is something that she was so afraid to do before in case she needed help or in case things were really bad. She was so scared to be alone when things were at their worst. And she actually just took a trip by herself across the country to go visit some friends and family. And she came back saying this was one of the most favorite trips she has had and knowing that she got to do this. And this was something that she never thought was going to be possible to do in the first place with any sense of ease, let alone by herself, packing so much later and just going and doing and being, and then not having to take that recovery time or those huge breaks in the meantime. And so I think these are just amazing to see how widespread these spinoff benefits can mm -hmm. be. They really can be just getting to spend time with our loved ones again, feeling better in our body in ways that we didn't even really expect or being able to check things off that list that we wanted to do, that bucket list or that goals list or, or whatever it is. Those spinoff benefits have, have no limit. They can be anywhere and be anything really. 
Oh, I just love this. I love everything about this. You know, this is why I love health coaching and I love health coaches. The role that health coaches can play is huge. It's huge and it's way undervalued, way underestimated. People have no idea the power that they have in their own choices, in their own lifestyle choices, the things that they eat, drink, think, do, feel, move, all of that makes such a profound difference. Um, and it really takes that little bit of hand holding. Like if they've been struggling with something for years, eh. You know, if they could figure it out on their own, they probably would have. But having someone who's already done it, I always say success leaves clues. So somebody who's already been through that journey that can now, you know, be the beacon, shine the light on the path, but then, you know, reach and hold that person's hand and walk them through that proven path that you carved out through the jungle yourself. And now that you've found that way, now you can, can bring people along and you are literally giving people their lives back not being able to go travel, not being able to see family and friends. Now they can, you know, you weren't even trying to help with PMS and you are, you know, the body's all one system. It's all connected. You weren't trying to help with relationships and you are personally, professionally. It's just, it's just so profound. The, the ripple, as you said, ripple effect is real. And uh, that, you know, IIN is one of those places that we heard about the ripple effect. It's tremendous. It's tremendous. So I just want to thank you, Reba. I could talk to you forever, for hours. Uh, you are the real deal. Uh, and I, you know, just wish you massive success with all of your studies and uh, just am so inspired. You know, the thing that's most important, like most, like, profound or the most rewarding, fulfilling, so satisfying, as I say, is seeing that transformation, that before and after. I just can't get enough of them. And I love your before and after story. And I love your clients before and after story. It's just, thank you for doing the work, showing up, shining your light, leading with love. Uh, the, this world needs you and your healing gifts and, and the world needs more health coaches out there. Um, and just my my role really is, is to let people know health coaches exist. They can play a huge impact. Find one that resonates with you and, um, and reach out to them. They're phenomenal people. They are good, great people to get to know and they have just an immense infinite toolkit in there because they had to figure it out the hard way. And, uh, and I know those things I had to fill out, figure out the hard way. I got an infinite vault of um, tools and, and things to, to, to work with now. Um, and that can really help accelerate somebody else's path. Um, and, you know, you're on a mission. You don't want people to be in pain. You know, you, that, that is one of the things. And, and our mission is to help people live their longest, healthiest lives. And that's where we align. How can people get in touch with you, Reba? If they're like, I got to talk to this girl. I got to talk to this woman. She's amazing. Uh, what's the best way for them to connect with you, ask you questions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can find me and connect with me on my website, fortomorrowwellness.com. That's F-O-R, tomorrowwellness.com. They can also join my free Facebook group, For Tomorrow Wellness. It has a little tiny yellow flower next to it if you're looking for it. And, um, you can also follow me on Instagram. My Instagram handle is that, uh, affirmation that I, I use and I give to my clients at for tomorrow with love. So a little bit different than the website it is for tomorrow with love. Um, and yeah, so I'd be happy to connect with anyone, anything that comes up. I'd love to have you in the group and in the community. So absolutely come on over and connect with me. Awesome. And I know you have some great free resources, that free Facebook group. That's a phenomenal opportunity there, guys. Great way. And um, you have a free starter kit that I think people can uh, get on your website. And uh, I just want to thank you. And I want to thank all of you, uh, our listeners, for listening in. If you have questions, pop them in the comments. Uh, you know, I can send them over to Reba or reach out to her directly. If there's another topic that you want us to cover, let us know. I'm happy to do that. I'll find an expert and we'll bring them them on so that we can uh, help you 
optimize and help this world be a healthier, happier place. So if you like this video, feel free to like and subscribe. Uh, that really does a lot to get these messages out and into the hands of people who can really benefit from them. So with that, have a thank you so much, Reba. Reba thank Shapiro. you so much for having me. My absolute this is so pleasure. Fun. <laughs> So, so good. So Reba Shapiro, thank you so much. And for all of you, thank you for listening and go out there and absolutely be good for you.